different here today. We still have to fill up the, the slides from, or complete the slides from last um, from from last class here. Um, but I wanted to also just show, take you into a piece of code that you'll find in your sandbox. And uh, this is like another piece of kind of like cool analysis that you can do at home. And we'll go through that. And then finally, we're going to go through um, some other pieces of uh, uh, of code that to help us to organize uh, the the tables of of data that we might find in uh, in our research. And so actually, it's going to be kind of an action-packed course, and so we'll see how much we get done today. But I'm thinking that we'll probably have, oh, I don't know, some stuff to do. <laughs> uh, I think I think we'll, it'll carry over until next week. But anyway, your, your slides should look like this, um, where you'll have these. Um, it's basically going to be found. In fact, your slides are going to be found in your, le your lessons directory, in your repository, in a directory called 05 and 07 exploration. So that's where you'll find this. That's for 05 week and 07 week. I just combined them both together because we were we were interrupted by the by the week six test. But let me just go back to one point that I wanted to make here. And there's many, many, many points. These are the slides that we hit last um, uh, last Tuesday. Um, and that is that we were about to talk about outliers, and I thought this might be a long conversation, but actually maybe it isn't such a long conversation. Um, there are some other pieces of code that uh, you, can, you can try out, which are very similar to what we were working on before. But actually, though, this, this work in outliers right here um, is actually quite important, because when we, um, in, our, in our test, when we were working on one of the problems in the test, there's a question that said something like, um, do you see an outlier which exists uh, at a particular um, a particular junction for uh, for some from a categorical variable, something like that. It was a, it was a question that was asking whether there's an outlier, and yes, there was an outlier. And an outlier is this, as you can see in your just like under my my cursor where I'm right now, just underneath that uh, where I'm where I'm highlighting, that is an outlier. It's a point of information which does not fit with the rest of the with the rest of the uh, the points. If these were clusters. Um, in, 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 uh, anal in analysis here, they call them clusters. In bioinformatics, they call them groups. But if they're, if they're clusters, these are two separate clusters. And if there are groups, like for instance, these are the growth patterns of different cells or whatever it may be, um, then this is actually pointing to uh, two separate groups with two separate traits, two detectable groups. And so um, we first of all, uh, when we first see these, these clusters, as they are right, right here, uh, we ask ourselves whether these clusters are, you know, anomalies or whether they are something like a, if it's a, maybe it's an error in my data. It could be both of those. It could be an, anom an anomaly. It could be an error. We have no idea. But the third thing that it could be is a discovery. It could be something quite extraordinary, um, which has come out of the the data which no one has noticed before, or that has no one no one has acted on before. Um, it's something that's uh, very much ahead of the curve. And so you can see that if this were a, uh, if, if these points on this on this plot that I'm looking at here, if they represented, I don't know, maybe um, companies or progressions or something of, of stocks and and you know, price and, and stock shares or something, then it seems that there's one stock share that's uh, actually doing quite well. And so you can see that it's not just an outlier necessarily, but it could be a discovery. But the thing is, though, the reason why I wanted to, to mention this, and I've been mentioning a point very similar to this all semester. And that is that in data analytics, we just get nice graphs. We don't get explanations for what these graphs actually mean. So for instance, in this case, um, we just have information that says that there's one point which is far ahead of the other points. And it is now up to us as data scientists to go through and find out how do we explain that one point. Is it an error? Is it an anomaly, which means it's not an error, it's just something that happened, or is it the discovery that you're waiting for? It's the, the big moment. Um, this is a story about how the uh, Apple iPod was actually um, kind of developed, I guess you can say, back in the early stages when uh, Steve Jobs was looking around for the next big thing for Apple, and they came up with the, the iPod. Now, the iPod's kind of like a phone that, that plays music, but there's no phone, it just holds a bunch of songs. And they did a survey, Apple did a survey, and the survey was asking people about um, how many songs they listen to um, per week or something. How many songs per week? And many people said, oh, they listen to like, you know, they, they listen to many, many, many songs. You know, they go out with their friends, they go dancing, they listen to songs in restaurants and bars and everywhere they go. And so they, they love their music. 
And um, then there's a question about something, saying something like, how many, um, how many songs can you actually carry around with you at any one time? And people were saying something like, um, I don't know, there's a, somebody was carrying around cassette tapes or something. Or, uh, you know, there's, you know, this like they were carrying, this is like before the, 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 you know, the MP3 player. Uh, and somebody was carrying around like tapes and they, were, and they were listening to these things on their tape player. And uh, that was actually kind of cool. And or something, actually it wasn't tapes, it was mini discs. That's what it was. And somebody was taking, taking their songs around on mini discs. But then there's a couple of, there's a group in this, um, in, in this group of music lovers in this, in this survey who would carry around like a seemingly, you know, small suitcase filled with their mini discs in which they would have like all their music. And so they were actually, they were actually able to listen to seemingly any music at any time. And so that was the blip on their screen, that there's some group of people who have a lot of music on them at every, any one time. And they went back to the, they saw this blip on their screen. They said, that's strange. How do we explain that? So they, get, they gave an, a, a further survey to these people. And they said, how is it that you have all this music? And they said, oh, we just carry, I just carry this, this uh, you know, my, my, my suitcase here or my case filled with my mini disc, discs. And I'm able to listen to everything. And so it was at that point that they realized, wait a minute. That's not just an outlier. <clears throat> That's the beginning of a new trend where people want to start bringing with them seemingly all their songs everywhere they go. And another follow-up question with the, this, the music lover group was that they said uh, they carried all their music around because they didn't know whether they were going to be stopping in at the gym and they needed some music for gym work or they were going to be going to the library and they needed some work for concentration or they were going to be going uh, out to see friends and they wanted some kind of up-and-coming kind of hip-hop type music to help them kind of get into the mood, you know, who knows? But a lot of people are very motivated by the music that they listen to. Anyway, but that's the big, the big story behind the outliers, is that what looks to be an outlier on your screen uh, does not necessarily mean that it's, a, that it's an error. In fact, it could be, it could just be the big discovery that you're looking for. So don't discredit those. Um, here we have <clears throat> some, other, some other pictures of outliers, O1 and O2, these are different types of outliers. And one of the big problems that we have to deal with here, um, and it just goes to me, I just have to say this, is that you don't know whether that discovery O1 is coming from the group G1 or whether O1 is coming from G2. In other words, you have no idea where that data came from. You just see that there's this, this, these different groups on your screen, and so that makes things more complicated. And so that gives us all the more reason as data scientists uh, to go through and figure out uh, where these, uh, these points come from and to find out how you can explain them. I mean, it's very, very important. Anyway, so I think that that's, I think that that's basically that. Uh, all I want to say in the outliers for that. Um, if there's any questions in these, you can go ahead and let me know. Um, I'm going to move on to the next thing now. You can go ahead and try these pieces of code here. Uh, really what they're doing, this is really the same thing that we've been working with before with, the, with these bin widths. But this last piece of information here uh, helps us to set the scale uh, for how big we want the uh, the scale, or how we how big we want the the canvases to be in, in which we put our plots. So that's your your y limit here. So you're going from zero. This is a vector again. B. It should be C. It should be a V here. But this is your vector going from zero to fifty, and that's on the, your your x or your your y axis here. So you're you're saying show me the points or plot them in a in a uh, in a space of zero to fifty. Anything that's after 50 gets cut off. As you can see, this bar, I guess, kind of gets cut off at that point. Maybe not, maybe it goes a little bit higher. But anyway, but still, if you're, if you're trying to put things in there that are too tall or taller than this limit, they will get cut off. Um, anyway, you can go ahead and try these out and see what you think. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say about, about these things. I think we'll move on to the next, next slides. Um, oh, one more thing, uh, looking at this. This is a, a kind of a hard and fast, this slide should have been maybe further up toward the outliers here, but this is actually rather interesting code. I'm not gonna run this, but perhaps you can run this. But what this thing does is it uses the filter command, as we all know, the filter command that's going to be, basically what it does is it takes the diamonds command, or the diamonds data set, and then it filters out all values of, of, um, it, it, of it, it filters out all the values of, of, of y for which y is less or less than three and greater than 20. In other words, those are the ones that are, are the supposed the, um, out, or the, the outliers, I guess. If you are a y value here, which is uh, less than three or greater than 20, then that, those are the values that we want to uh, kind of remove here. And so these are the ones that are going to be set. Um, these are the, we can see these are the values that are, that are touched here. So we have y values that are equal to zero, 
maybe those are outliers, maybe they're no good for us. And then we have y values, which are like 31.8 and 58, or 50, yeah, 58.9. Those are values which are obviously greater than 20. And so this over here is not a pipe, that's an or. So you're saying that if y is less than three or y is greater than four, then filter it. Um, anyway, that is that. I'm gonna move on to the next thing. So you can try that code out and kind of get an idea about how you, you like, or how you, uh, how you can use that, that code in your own work. It's uh, really straightforward. Now, one thing that uh, we've been talking about um, is uh, like doing kind of like back of the envelope types of calculations here, to, really to figure out, for instance, uh, what is the, to do some quick analysis, like what is the answer to such and such question? But you don't want to spend a huge amount of time doing this, but you, you do want to answer the question though. You do want to have some kind of quick and easy uh, system. And so what I thought we would do is work on, um, we'd go to this, uh, this data set here that I found on a website called 538, which is a uh, like a political website. In fact, if you go to this thing, you can find all kinds of data. In fact, I'll just take you back there and show you. But this is a website that gives you information about, um, you know, for instance, how uh, different types of how different Congress people are doing, or information about Congress and and about the government. And I thought that, you know, and and, and the House of Representatives. And I thought that this is kind of you know appropriate right now, given that, for instance, as we're, we're thinking about voting. And uh, you know, it's, the world is becoming much more political. This is not designed, by the way, to to I'm not trying to um, to cast my my political institutions on you. I'm just trying to tell you or how to how you can use code like this to determine whether a president is popular or not, or you can use this code for other things too. But this is a website that's given by 538, and what it's doing is it's talking about how popular or unpopular Donald Trump is. Now, this is not a political discussion here. This is just the data. And so you can see that as you move this line over this data set, you can see that you're, you're, these numbers move around. And what these numbers are, are polls. So for instance, I guess every day, there's like you know, tens of polls which are, which are given by Gallup and by other groups um, where they call up people on the phone or they have people do things, I guess, online, but they ask people their opinions about how they, if they approve or disapprove of the president, um, president's actions in office. And you can see kind of where these points are. So what we're looking at, the, these lines are the, I guess, the, the averages, I guess you can say, of all the points that were taken for uh, whatever this day was here. So on, on October 15th, which is today, this number will probably change because the polls are being done all the time. But you'll get this, there's a, there's a point, like right where my cursor is, see that? You can, it's on the, but it, wherever, when, you, when you touch the line there, there's a, there's a point. And that point represents, I think, the average of all the, the disapproved or approved uh, surveys that day. So for, in the red here, and again, I don't like these colors because of, well, one out of eight guys is colorblind, so they won't see the difference. But well, you, this is, um, you kind of get this idea about how the trends are moving around between things that are, well, between how people are, how they feel that they approve or disapprove of the president's meetings. One thing I will say, this is which is kind of interesting, is that these these um, these lines appear to be um, reflections of each other. That's uh, not necessarily on purpose, but that's just the way it is. That is actually a bias that we see that's coming through on, in human nature, and the bias is um, actually quite interesting. Uh, when people uh, disapprove of something, they tend to approve of it less. That makes any sense to you. So if I saw a film which I really disapproved of, what a waste of the director's time. I mean, I can't believe this. Like, what a waste. Ugh. If I disapproved of that film, then the chances are that my approval of that film would also go down. And so this is, uh, you have to ask both questions when you're, you know, do you approve or dis do you disapprove of a, of a presidential or, or a you know, polit political uh, candidate here? You have to ask those, both of those questions. But you can see that one question kind of gives you ideas about the answer to the other question. And that's just the way that human nature works. So there is a lot of kind of connections between these two data sets. Um, if you go down here, you can see the data set themselves. This is like um, right here, I'm looking at the, um, the Rasmussen Reports, Pulse Opinion Research, uh, the Morning Consult, the, uh, YouGo the YouGov, the NBC News. These are the groups that are actually going out and doing polls, asking people they, whether they approve or disapprove. And then these results that they get go back to, if you, have, if you approve, then your result will go, uh, you'll write how many people approved of your, 
of your survey, 47% on the first line for the Rasmussen reports, and 51% disapproved. And then you have this adjusted here. Now, the adjusted um, rate allows you to compare survey to survey. Otherwise, you're comparing one survey, which might be done on the East Coast, to another survey, which is done on the West Coast, and maybe the numbers of people who are involved are completely different. Maybe the geography is different. Maybe something else is different. And so to compare those two numbers doesn't make mathematical sense because they're completely disconnected from each other. But this adjusted means that the both sets here have been weighted in such a way so that you actually now can compare them together and it's mathematically appropriate to do so. Um, you'll have to find out how they adjust their work. There's many different methods of actually transforming the data to make 47% uh, into 42% by this adjusted thing here, but it's probably an equation that they use, which counts, that's, uh, has, has used all the other data uh, in that equation. Anyway, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a whole class after that, but it's, that's basically the transformation. Um, anyway, what I want to say is that um, while that's all very cool, you can see some other things on this thing about, um, I can go through these, these plots at the bottom here, and I can see how, for instance, Barack Obama um, compares to Trump how George W. Bush compares to Trump, or how at, at, during the same time of their presidency, how Bill Clinton, how Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and all the other usual suspects here, how they all compare to Trump during their presidencies. You'll notice that, that Trump's green line across all these plots here is exactly the same, but the other plots um, are different. And uh, one thing I will say, which is actually kind of interesting, is you can see that when you start looking at, like the, you know, the, at Lyndon Johnson down here, and Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, you can see that the, the data sets that they have come out looking very boxy, which almost makes it look like it's some kind of a you know, categorical data that, that they're, they're trying to plot. But actually the reason for that is because they had many fewer surveys um, given each week. And so in some weeks they may have had, maybe we may have had like some time frames where they had, you know, for a week, they only had one survey. And that's why the line didn't jump around very much because you only had that one survey for that block of time and so the line was straight. Whereas you can see that today, uh, the line, the green line, and Obama's line, and maybe even to some extent George Bush's line, um, really bounces around all over the place, and that suggests that there is um, there's hundreds of surveys coming out every day. There's there, the, what I'm saying is that the, the data is coming is becoming much more rich. Um, one thing that's another interesting thing that comes to mind is I'm looking at George W. Bush. I don't know whether anyone can explain to me this. Sudden, everything's down here at 56 or 51.8, and then his, his approval rating jumps up to 82.7. What was that? You just go ahead and tell me. Let me go ahead and unmic and tell me. Or mic, uh, unmute. Is that 9-11? Uh, yes, that is 9-11. That is 9-11. And so, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, thank you for telling, thank you. So the thing is, what I wanted to say is that that again, on our screen, we just have a blip. We have no idea how to explain it, but now we have to go back and think, okay, well, what happened around that time? I'm using 9-11 not to be political, but to, uh, because it's one of the most noticeable jumps. But 9-11, though, was at that time. And on our, our, our graphs here, our plots, we have no idea actually what caused any of this stuff. I mean, look at this. I mean, it's, it's really actually kind of frustrating. You see all these points bumping around. You see another point, like for instance, like, um, I'm looking at uh, maybe you can't really see, but, but George Bush. There's this. Uh, there's 9/11, and then it kind of scales back a bit, and then it jumps up again to um, 67.0, going up again. Something happened. What happened? I have no idea. I have no idea. And the only way I can find out is probably by going back to the news of that time, trying to figure out how to explain that. But this is the frustration of being a data scientist, in that you have all this, these, you have this pulse and and this beat on your on your screen from the plot, but you really have no idea how to explain it. And so now, as a data scientist, you have to go back to the data and kind of find out what that point was and then go back to some of the some theories and figure out how to explain that point. Otherwise, you have nothing. You just have an idea that something happened. Like for instance here, I'm looking at Harry S. Truman, 1945 to 1953. Something really bad happened with Harry S. Truman um, around, I would say, after his 455th day, 56th day perhaps, something happened where his popularity suddenly fell well below the, the point. That suggests to me that it was some kind of a scandal. Um, 
this is interesting. If I look at John F. Kennedy here, I can see that actually his data just stops. That was because because he was assassinated. So what I'm trying to say, though, is that looking at the data, there is a story to tell, but you don't always know what that story is. So you go back to the kind of the, the historical context and put that data into some kind of in, 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 to analyze that data to put it into some kind of context. In other, in other words, you, you don't you have nothing when you look at these plots here. And this is, I think, a point that I was making on Tuesday, where when you're looking at these plots, um, you have these um, I mean, you, you have you have uh, certain articles that are coming out of the news where they'll show you a plot like this and they'll say, oh, this argues our point. This is our this is the reason why I just said that such and such and such and such. Well, the thing is, though, that you don't know that. All you know is that, that there is something going on in your plot. And you don't know exactly what it was. And so you still have to go back and, and kind of check the facts, and check to see how that, that point was actually created. Anyway, I don't want to take up all your time with that. I think you know exactly what, I'm, what I mean by that. But one thing I really wanted to, wanted to show you down here is that you can actually go after this data. You can actually download the data. And so if I click on this polls data right down here, um, it's going to ask me to, um, to open this data, by, this data in, in, my, uh, in my browser. I can actually grab this data and, and open it. And so I've just done that. And so now what I'm going to do is I want to take you back to the code that we were working on before uh, in R, where I'm going to actually pull across that. Um, I want to actually show you kind of like how to use this, this code here. This code is actually going to make similar types of plots and graphs that, what we, that, that we saw in, in um, that previous website. Um, so in the, in the 538 website. And so it's kind of cool, kind of neat. So anyway, I, I thought that we would... Rather than having this, uh, having everyone type this in, I'll just give you the code so that you have it. Um, I'm doing this because I understand now that the, um, the the clarity isn't always perfectly clear when you're looking at this on Zoom. I do apologize for that; it doesn't always work out very well. Um, but what I'm going to do though is I'll just take you through this. So here I am up here on this thing. This remember is your your line of code that removes all the variables that are lurking around in memory, so you can kind of get a new fresh slate. Um, then the next thing I'm going to do here is we're actually going to talk about this in our next in our next data set, in our next uh, slide here that we have that you already have. But read.csv, this is another one of those table commands here. It basically reads data from a table. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to read data from a table that I'm going to get from a file. But what file? This is going to give me a file name. And that file name will then be opened by this read CSV. I'm going to hold on to the, the headers. That means that the table or the, uh, the file that I have when I open it up, it's a CSV file or a comma separated file. At the top of each header, I'll have a name. And so I want to, I want to uh, retain those names. Otherwise, I could, I could, I mean, I could give them my own names. Why bother? They're already there. Otherwise, those, um, if you don't, if this is, if this is false, then the header names themselves will become data. And that might throw things off, especially if you're trying to plot a, a, a row of data, which is all numbers as it goes through. And then you have this one word at the top saying, you know, values. So anyway, that's what this is all about. Go ahead and run this. And although you don't see what I see on my screen, uh, it's asking me to pick a file. I'm going to the file that I, that I actually, you have this file already in your, in your, in your class docs repository. But it's uh, also the same file that we just downloaded um, from the uh, 538. And the file that you're looking for is, where can I find that? Of course it's. <laughs> um, so the um, file... Professor? Yes, sir. Um, how do you download the data set from the 538 website? So how do you download that? You should be able just to click on that. Um, so if you go down to the, it's this link down here. If you go down to the very, very bottom, you see where I am? There's this file here called polls. If you just click on, if you just click on polls, probably can't. But what I see when I click on that word polls is it asks, because okay. you see that? Yeah. So store that, but store that file somewhere where you can get to it. But actually though, I've already, I've, I mean, I know it sounds like I've changed the data and I want you to see my data, but I've already, I've already um, as of last night, I downloaded that file. And you'll find it in your class docs repository in a, a directory called data. But in the okay. future, but in the future though, Alex, you wanna you wanna I mean, you'll wanna go back to this website and download it again because that's your updated data. Good question though. Hopefully everyone else found the, the file. Hopefully they did. No, no trouble there at all. 
that's the case, I'll go on. <laughs> okay, so um, now I'm going to go in here. So now what I want to show you though is now that I've just downloaded this file and you can see that my global my global variable, if I type on show you this, my global variable in the, on the right hand side says pull list. That's because I gave it, oops, I gave it this file name here, pull list. Now, if I go ahead and run this view over here, view, then what I get is the data itself. I can actually see what this data is. So again, some of these columns are arguably redundant. Maybe you don't need to have all this information, but they added there because when you put together all the data that comes from, um, when you put all, I mean, all the data from the website, then maybe they become less redundant. For instance, I'm talking about the column president. This is all about Trump. It's not about any other presidents. And so why do they have to keep putting his name in the column here? Well, they do that because if you are going to be grabbing the, um, sorry. If you're going to be grabbing data from the, um, uh, from, from all the presidents to do some kind of a, you know, an ex a big kind of a, an exhaustive analysis, then now you know that every single line has the name of the president to which the data uh, informs, or to, or in, or to report. Also, you have a subgroup here. I'm not exactly sure what that means. That must be some internal thing here, but a subgroup, I guess it means it's all polls. Maybe you have, maybe there's a different category of data that, that isn't from the polls. Um, but the most important thing is you have the model date here. The model date is like when that information was actually taken. So on the very, very top of this thing here, I see that the Gallup polls data came out in, what was that, October 14th, which was just yesterday. So it was yesterday's data. It's like hot off the press. Um, what do they mean by the start and end date? I think the start and end date might have something to do with some internal thing. I'm not actually using that. But the, um, the polls, it, it must have some, I mean, it has some, some meaning to them. I just lost it. Anyway, but then we have, for instance, the pollster. I've just organized everything by pollster. I should have done that. But... Okay. Um, now the pollster is, is the actual the group that, that put together this poll. Like who was like what was the name of the, the company? And sometimes you need to know that because you might think that you know, you want to you, you don't want to use any of the, um, the the data that comes in from you know uh, Abacus uh, data because maybe for instance they don't have the same kind of standards that you're. That you you would like to enjoy in your in your in your work here, so you have all that. Oops, I think I just lost that, didn't I? But you have but you have that data here, and then you have Gallup, for instance. You have Morning Consults, Ipsos. These are some other big groups that are always out there. But anyway, what I'm saying is, is, is you have some kind of credibility. That's why they have that name there. You have some kind of credibility, whether it's good or whether it's bad. You should have some idea about where this data comes from. Now let's go back to this adjusted here. So this is just a print statement that just says. What you're looking at. So if you're just running this all together and you're looking at the output, you have a print statement that says what it is. Now this code, I'll just take you through this code here. But what this code is doing is it is going through and it's finding. Here we are. Again, this is our old friend ggplot. And ggplot, I'm saying what the data is, which is pull list. Remember, pull list is this. It's the listing of polls that we created here from this uh, read CSV. Now what we're doing is we have this gm point. Gm point. That was one of the questions on this on the test. There is no geom scatter, it's geom point, because we're dealing with points. I would have used geom scatter because they call them scatter plots, but you asked me, <laughs> which is okay. Uh, the next thing we're doing here is we're making a mapping here. We have our aesthetics uh, you know, function. What it's doing is it's assigning x from one, and this is actually kind of a strange, you know, put this in one line here. Uh, can I just get this on one line? Get this on one line. But what we have here is the, um, this is all part of the same equation, but you have to have some way of defining your x-axis. Remember your x-axis, it runs along the bottom of the of here. So I defined the x-axis by saying x is equal to one, or from the very start, all the way to the x or to the length of the adjusted approve. Now what that means is adjusted approve but well, what is that? That's going back to our data set. And if I can just go over there, there's more information over here. We have the grade, we have the sample size, we have the population, we have the weight, influence, approved, disapprove, adjusted, approve, adjusted, disapprove. So what I'm doing is I'm actually using the adjusted approve, which is this value right here. 
That value is, remember, the weighted number so that we can now compare one pole with any other pole in the same list. So it's, um, it's, it's a mathematically appropriate uh, comparison. Otherwise, if you're just comparing one pole to another, they may not be the same. And one thing I would like to say, though, is that notice how this we have the, in the sample size. This is like how many people were actually asked. Uh, in the, this is a survey. But they're saying, how many people did we actually ask in the survey? And I'm just going to go ahead and format this or sort this. Here's one survey by Ipsos where they asked 121 people. 121 people. Does 121 people actually count for the total opinion of the United States of America? Unlikely. There's too many people here. In fact, I think that it was, uh, um, I mean, you, you have some, some polls that, that come out there where they just, they are, they're only asking certain groups of people in, in small areas uh, where there's uh, only a few, and they're asking only a few people, a small number of people, and, they, and they're saying that, that that small number of people represents the whole country. That doesn't, that doesn't work that way. The largest poll that they have here uh, appears to be 216,754 uh, people. And so that's maybe more indicative of the United States. But going back to a number which is as small as 121, that's just too small. That's really not a good, um, I claim, not a very good, very good number. But that's why, for instance, now we have this adjusted approve and adjusted disapprove. This adjusted value now means that even though we have a small number of people, we can still use that data in some way. And so that's why, going back to our, um, going back to my, my uh, code here, I'm using the adjusted approve. But I need to know, for instance, how many adjusted approve pieces of data are there that I'm plotting? And so, for instance, I need to go from, from one to the very last one here. So I'm, I'm counting how many there are. Remember that if I go from, for instance, one to, let's say, uh, six, it gives me all these numbers in the middle here. And so that is kind of setting the stage for my x-axis here. Now, my y is going to be the values themselves, uh, which uh, correspond to the, uh, the x, the numbers along, or the, the, the placements along the x-axis. And so that's what this adjusted approve is all about. You can see that uh, it's this data right here. All right. Very cool. So now when I go ahead and run this thing here, oops, I think I've already run this, but when I go ahead and run this thing here, I'm uh, also putting in a color here. I'm adding some extra information. I'm covering this whole thing in my color um, relates to, uh, for instance, the adjusted approve. I guess, I, I guess I'm kind of being redundant here. Maybe I don't need to add that color again. But just to make the point, I'm just adding some color here. I know that the, that the Y is already the adjusted approve here, and the color is the adjusted approve. Maybe, for instance, it's, um, it's, it's, it's overkill. But otherwise, it does make an interesting graph to look at, though. And you can see that as the numbers are dark, at the bottom here, that means there is less uh, adjusted approval. And when the numbers are, are lighter green, or sorry, lighter blue at the top, that means there's more. OK, so we have those, we have those things here. And now I'm going to add a, a special smooth line to this thing. Now, remember what the smooth line was? The smooth line, you can hardly see this, because the smooth line is blue. But the smooth line is, um, is a kind of a representation of the points. In other words, you, you don't necessarily need to see the points uh, to see where the line, or just to, 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 to see what the, what's going on. You can look at the point, or sorry, you can look at the line and get an idea about the, about the, the trends that you'd find in the, in the points. That line is your linear re regression model. We'll, we'll talk about that later on. But that's a line, though, that's actually made out of a model. Now, as you're looking at this line, um, you can see that where the line goes up around x equals 5,000, you can see that that line begins to kind of like it starts going up. You can see the points also start going up at that point, too. But the thing about the line is that when you have the smooth line, it's, 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 it makes reading your data easy, but then you don't see the actual distributions of the points themselves, which, which some would argue is a, is a great travesty in, in analysis. If you can't see the distribution of the points, then Means you're doing, you're missing out. The next one is going to be disapproval. The code works exactly the same. Where, for instance, we have this ggplot talking about the data set, then we're making up some points, or we're mapping on the x-axis. We're, max, we're mapping uh, again the same the same level of the x-axis here, but it's now it's we're looking at all the points that are talking about disapproval. Our y is going to be disapproval. The color is going to be the adjusted disapproval here. So it's like the same thing, but just the opposite. Then I'm putting in a smooth map or a smooth line here where 
my mapping and aesthetics, which is almost exactly the same. It's, kind of, it's, just, it's the same same stuff as before. Again, we have to tell you know, what's the what's the scale on the x-axis, what's the scale on the y-axis, or how many how many points are there, or the scope, I guess. I guess what's the scope of the x-axis and the scope of the y-axis. What are we actually looking at for the y? And then we have a color. And so you have all this information that's kind of just all stacked together, and that's where this plot comes from. I'm uh, moving into the next thing here. I'm going to make another print statement of a of this uh, h line at the average means of each sample. Now this is this gets a little bit complicated. Oops, do that. Um, I'll do this approval disapproval here. Sorry, I don't mean to keep. I don't mean to keep confusing here. Okay, here's a better one. Now I'm putting. I'm basically putting two different graphs together. We know how to do this. I'm superimposing one thing over the other. So where you see the, uh, looks like it's purple. On my screen, maybe it's a slightly different color, but it's, a, it's purplish on this screen. Um, this purple with this red line, that is supposed to be, what is that here? That's going to be your disapproval line. And then what I'm doing is I am, in fact, what is that? That's here. This is your approval. In fact, you've already seen the approval stuff over here. This is your, in fact, if, you just, if I just go ahead and plot this, this line right here, this is your disapproval right there. And what I've done is I'm taking this plot, which is on the screen now, and I'm just changing the color and superimposing it with the other plot that we've already seen that talks about the approval rate. When you have them both together on the same plot, it allows you to do a kind of a comparison as we, that we before. Um, by the way, there is this, there's this horizontal line that goes through these points this horizontal line um, is called the geom h line. If you do any coding in HTML, you'll find that there's something called the h line, something very similar to that. But the it's a horizontal line, and also there's a I see that's a, there's a, there are horizontal lines that exist in Markdown, but we just we just use the the three you know, dash dash dash. But you can there are other ways of, of doing them. But the horizontal lines. Um, exists in seemingly all types of graphing software. You can just create a line and just throw it in there and see what happens to the data um, around that line. And so this line has been defined by, I know this looks kind of strange here, but what this code over here means is it says, take the very first, this is your, the number here, this is like a, a, an array, and it says, go to the adjusted approval array. Give me the first element. That's what this is here. The array of the adjusted approval, give me the first element of that of that array. Then go to the other, or then the the, the like the, the next or the same that same, that same list here, uh, and then go to or, or to the disapproval list here, and give me the second thing and then divide it by two. I guess actually maybe this shouldn't be a disapproval. That might be approval. That was probably left over in the last class, so I didn't have to change that. Save it. But if you, go ahead and save this on your thing right now. Save it so that you're looking for adjusted approval and adjusted approval here. There we go. That's better. It should be approval for both of them, but it's basically taking the, taking the first adjusted approval and the second adjusted approval approval um, element, and it's divided them by two. In other words, this is the average. And so you get that average. And so this horizontal line that we see here is like the first and second day, I guess, of the Trump president, those approvals. And so you're using that to kind of see whether that sets a pace for the rest of the data set. Um, yeah, so please do make sure that you've changed that. That was a bug. I changed that last time we saw this in class. I can change it back. Sorry about that. Make sure this one is also done now. Um, so here we go again. Uh, this is a, uh, let me go ahead and change this one too. But now when I put this data, so when I put the approval and disapproval uh, plots together, in one plot, in one thing, I get this. And so remember, the the red is going to be the um, the disapproval, and the and the blue is going to be the approval. But the code is exactly the same. And one thing I've done is everything looks really really messy. If you if you put this out on so that everything's on its own line, then it looks a bit cleaner to understand. But actually, the code is exactly the same in in both plots here. The only difference is, and I don't expect you to know how to do all this stuff freehandedly here. That's why it's always easier to work when you have your computer open. You don't have to, you don't have to regurgitate this code to, uh, to make this plot. But all I've done, though, is I've just changed, uh, for instance, here's the color blue, and here's the color dark blue. I've, I've, those are for the, 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 the line and the points themselves. And then I have the color purple, and I have the other color red, and that's for the line that's in the, for the disapproval. 
and the actual data itself has just changed. And so the code is the same. I'm just changing the x and y points and color. And that is it. That's, that's, that's really all that there is to it. There's no more magic than that. But there's one thing I wanted to talk about, though, which uh, I haven't mentioned so far, and that is, in fact, I can move this down. There's this piece of code here, and this allows us to actually save this information, save this file in some way. So I'm going to call this pull list.png. In fact, what I ought to do is to give it a place where I'm actually going to, I can actually save it. I'll just save this in my temp directory. That means the file will go away when I reset my machine, but that's okay because I don't need it around. I can just create the next file next time. So I'll do that. I create this, this I have this, this command over here saying, here's the file name. And then when I go down to the next line and I plot this thing, it says, create this plot. Oh, actually, I should change that too, sorry. It says, create this plot, but create the plot in memory. Don't actually print the, or don't, you don't detect, and sometimes you, you see it printed out, but not always. But it's, it, you're making this plot in memory. And then what you're doing is this last command here called dev off, development off, Another command that doesn't seem to make too much sense. But what it does is it stops the, uh, it says, okay, that's the, that, whatever information you have in memory right now, whatever information you have in your, on your canvas, put that information into a file. And, and so now if I go to my, um, hope you can't see this. Um, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find the file. <laughs> I'm trying to find my file. Where's my file? It would help my, my computer. My keyboard wasn't smooth either to me. Wait. Hang on a second, let me... Um, um, I'm just gonna find my file. Ah, oh, where are you? Okay, so let's see. Cop. Ah, ah, okay, here we go. Um, let's see if I can get this. So what file would be? Let's <laughs> find my file. Um, anyway, I do have the file here. I'm just trying to find my. Okay, anyway, but uh, let's see. I, I can show you the file. Uh, back to. I have to ch I have to change my setting each time I each time I, I, I use this thing. Anyway, the file is there. <laughs> Maybe I, um, I can I can bring it back and try and show you. But the file is there. It just gets saved in in my temp directory, and so it's you don't always. Um, I, I'm doing my settings right now. I close down this machine, as you know, I lose my settings. But there, you can see my there. You, know, you can see my terminal. So here, oops, um, you can see my pull list file, which is right here, pull list. And that's the file that actually has my data. In fact, what I can do is I'll copy this into my desktop here so I can actually read the file. And then, which I don't need to actually get. And then I'll take you back to my scene, I'm not seeing slides here, and I'll show you what the file actually looks like. Um, where that is. Somewhere here, here we are, there. So now you can see, you can actually create files. But the reason why this is important, um, not because it makes a pretty cool looking design, but also um, if you're writing up some kind of a scientific paper or some kind of study where you need to, to record your graphics, um, you now have, this, you now have the, the, the graphics or the, 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 the code um, that will give you that, that power. And so going back to uh, your, your code, just remember if you define the file here, and then you run a plot here, whatever your plot may be, however complicated it may be, it still has to plot, so it's not gonna be any faster, but it still has to plot everything. But then once that plot has happened, then everything is like in memory and, and it's in the, the survey or in the canvas, then you have this command here called dev op, and dev op is going to record what it sees in the memory into a file. And so you have some quite interesting stuff you can work with now to kind of get an idea about how the popularity is changing as, um, as it's, as it's going on. The um, next thing I wanted to talk, talk about here is um, you have this other, this other code here that we've been working with, um, Plotly, another, like the Plotly library. If I go ahead and just run this, the same code, at least it should be. It should change, probably change on this code here. 
this this line is I don't think it's going to show up, but it's I need to change it. Um, here we go. Let's change that. Let me see. I don't think actually right now though I don't think that we even see those those lines anymore. So it's kind of like maybe they're not even necessary. But this is taking some time on my machine. Stuff running. But this is that interactive uh, plotting device. You can, so, for instance, I can now click on this, move my mouse, thing here. But you can actually like compare uh, points along the same, um, at the same at the same time here. So, for instance, that uh, this x equals um, I don't know ten thousand seven hundred ninety-nine. I guess that's how many how many poles there were. I'm not sure why that point six three is there, but it must mean something. But that's the number of poles that we had. After my 10,000th poll, um, I can look at, for instance, all the different um, approval and disapprovals at that, at that particular moment using this. It's quite exciting, but um, still, do spend some time here. I mean, obviously, go and vote, but do spend some time to kind of like go through some of your, your own um, analysis um, before you vote. I and mean, you can find, if you go back to this website, um, one thing I was going to talk about on my way back. Um, Around. But if you go back to the website we're looking at, there's, there's information about uh, Donald Trump, but also, though, you can go back to 538, and there are seemingly other kinds of information out there, too, that you can download, like other data sets uh, that you can work with uh, to help make your vote perhaps more informed. Uh, for instance, here you can look at, uh, there's, a, an, uh, there's articles here about the um, Amy Tony Barrett um, confirmation. And so you can find out information about what people think about that, and then you can plot that and put in, in all kinds of analysis. And so what I'm saying is that there is data um, everywhere you can use. And sometimes, though, if you run these data sets yourself and, and, uh, and actually do your own analyses, you will notice, you will see things that the media, I hate to say, I, I sound like I'm some kind of crazy person here, but, but the, that the media leaves out there, and that's called cherry picking. That means you're finding information, which is, which is in your in your um, you're finding information that uh, that gives you maybe a fuller story of what's going on, which was left out by some article, so that you don't be, you don't become distracted by by what they would think is bad news. That's what they call misinformation. And in fact, in this class, we do have a, an activity where we talk about misinformation coming up later on. Anyway, it's actually quite exciting. But please do go out and vote. But also make sure that you're I mean go visit credible websites and find out what's going on so that your vote is more meaningful. <laughs> okay, here's the, uh, so here we are in the book here. We're at the, we're at chapter eight. We're at web, uh, the web address 11. And, uh, the web, sorry, the web chapter 11 here. So you can find out like where we are by going through these things here. Um, one thing I'd like to mention so far is that um, we are now our studio programmers. Pat yourself on the shoulders and say, ha-ha, I am an R studio programmer. And that's uh, actually, that's a very good thing. But now that we are programmers, you might want to kind of spend some time looking around our studio and finding out about some of the, 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 the options which might make your code a little bit easier, your experience with R studio a little bit easier. Um, so here's some, just some, some, some suggestions that I put down here. Um, consider starting with a clean slate. That means always running a, uh, your R Studio um, without having any variables left over from previous analyses. In other words, you might want to go to your session and use the restart R command. And when you use restart R, it's going to kind of like flush out the memory and give you some new stuff or some, some new working space. But the thing is, though, that you um, will also have to reload your libraries. And so if you're running your code again, after you've, after, you've, after you've restarted your, your R and it's not working, it probably means that you have to reload your libraries. And so it's for that reason um, that I'm always talking about going into your, um, you, you know, you're, you're making a file, for instance, like up here, as we've done, uh, where at the very, very top of the, of the, of the code, you have these, uh, this information here about like, kind of, you have your libraries defined, you have everything there. And the, the, the whole point of this is that I should be able just to go ahead and select the whole, the whole everything and just click on run, and then I know that I have to 
click my file yet. But if I just click on run, um, it should give me, actually what I have to give my, yeah, it should, I should be able to get my, my, my uh, I haven't, uh, since I, I dumped my code here, I lost my, my variable file here, but that's okay. But what I'm saying though, is that you should be able to write your, or run your code in such a way so that, so that all the stuff that you're doing here, everything that you're working on, is just in the code. All you need to do is run the code and then you can get your same analysis back. And that will be very handy to you later on when, for instance, you quit for lunch, close your computer down to go to a different class and then come back to this later on. You're going to find that when you come back to this, you might forget what variables you put in memory or how they, how they are there or, or what. Um, okay. Another thing that I would like to mention here is um, consider not saving your environment after each session. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, save everything, save your environment. But I say, don't save your environment after each session. Because if you save your environment after each session, what that means is it saves all your commands you've typed in, everything you've typed in. For better or for worse, the, the, the commands that worked, as well as the commands that didn't work, type them all in and then, and then, if, then save them as a kind of a log when you close down R. I say don't do that because it just makes a lot of clutter. It also encourages the habit of perhaps not saving the code that works in your script file. And so then you're going back to your code like the night before some test is due or some, or some, some graphic, I don't know graphic, but your, uh, your, your, your lab is due. And you're, trying to, you're working with your graphics, you're trying to make sure everything come out and it's not working because the code you're trying to run is the code that you found didn't work two or three days ago. And so do not save all your old stuff. Um, instead, so instead, save your work into your source files so that you just have to run the file and get right back to it. And so to actually stop, to actually stop your, um, your, your files from, or your, your R Studio from creating a log file, um, there's an option here under general that says save workspace from or to, dot R data. I put mine down as never because otherwise I just get all this junk which confuses me later on and I have no idea whether this stuff works or not. It's just code that could be good, it could be bad. It's better that I just throw everything away and, and, and manually copy in the stuff that does work into my source code. Anyway, just an idea. Now, what we're talking about today is we're gonna be talking about, remember we saw, this, um, we saw this, this command already before, read, comma, separated variable. We used that just now when we were loading that Trump data set. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to use this again to create my own data set on the fly. This is really a lot about how um, analytics works, where, for instance, you're, you're working with data. Actually, I'll go ahead and, and make a new file here just so I can work this thing here. I'm going to my new script. Uh, oof. And I'm gonna create a, a file, let's call this in class, I guess, something, give a name. I'm gonna save it now. You can't see what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm saving the file someplace nice and choosing a place where I can put this. Um, where am I? Lessons, seven, oh. I'll put uh, in class. And the date today is the 15th October. Okay, so I'll go ahead and put this data in here. Now, you'll notice that, uh, of course, the formatting is never conserved, which drives me absolutely bonkers. Uh, I can, by the way, I can get rid of these, these old plots here by clicking a little bit on the where the plots are there's a little broom icon that you can see and if i click on that broom icon then a message comes up saying do you want to clear all the items in the history i say yes now i can clean that out but what i've just done though is getting back to this table here imagine i'm working on some kind of data set um i've created my own table we were working with a table like for instance up here this trump data set that's a table and so now I'm actually creating a table, in fact, the same type of table, just far less information, um, just by running the same code. And remember that when, let's go back to this code here. Um, here we are, read this file here, read CSV. There we go, there's read CSV. And again, we're showing, we're showing it right here. And so what this thing does is it loads data that's separated by um, commas, comma separated variables. Now in this, we have the luxury of having a line or line or line drop here or carriage return after A, B, C. Um, and so we're, we're actually defining the table by just where the line drops are. If I put, if I remove this, so what happens? If I remove that, does anything happen? I think it confuses. Yeah, it confuses. 
now it thinks that my table is this, and this is my these are my headers, and this is my data. And so you have to make sure that you're putting the line drops where they're supposed to be. So I think that just running it like that should be okay. Yeah, there we go. And so now what I'm going to do is I can save this, and I can call this my data. I think I think I've changed the name. This is already in your slides. If I run this, you'll see now that I've created a global a global variable in my environment. You can click on that, and you can see that this table looks very very similar to any other table that we've worked in, that we've worked with where the um, where the data has been organized. Now that's all very cool. Um, one thing that we can do also though um, is that you know of course my data give me the first row. Remember that? The first row, by the way, is not ABC. Oops, ABC. That is the column heading. Those are the, those are the names of the columns. The first row is one, two, and three. And give me the first column. I can change that. And I get this, one and four. And so really, I'm looking at this number here, one, and this number here, four. And so that's what my column is all about. And so what I'm trying to say is that the, the commands that we've been working with before, oops, they, they do. Um, they do work. So we have that. Now, going back to my slides, there's something else on the slides that was absolutely earth shattering, which I thought that you should talk. Oh, oh, oh. So here's something that's actually kind of, I'll just copy this in. But supposing, though, that I get some data from some source, um, I, and I want to change the names, I can do that. By the way, this little point right here, this slash n, uh, what that means is, while everything is on the line, that slash n means line or carriage return. That means drop the line. It's the same thing as what we saw before uh, in the graphic, for instance, where you have A, B, C, and then it seems to drop the line to one, two, and three. That line drop can also be accomplished by putting in this, and that's the character, means drop the line. Um, okay, so let's go back here, go back over here, and I'm gonna go ahead and just put this in here. Now, you'll see that, for instance, um, if I don't have this, let me just remove this again. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll modify this so that I don't have column names. What happens now? Do I get anything useful out of this? Well, so what I get is it thinks that this is the, it thinks that one, two, and three is the, are the column names. Just making a guess. It says the first thing that I see must be the names of the data set. So that means that four, five, and six are the actual pieces of data, but these are the columns. So actually, maybe I should be calling them Column one, column two, and column three. In fact, maybe what I should be doing is putting this in, into, their own, into their own quotes here, and maybe that would be something that. Yeah. So now I could write I could write my table like that. Uh, actually, it doesn't work very well. Thing happens. Maybe I can move these out of the way. Like it. Still doesn't like. Oh, it's because oh, it's because it's here. Um, let me go ahead and put this back. Maybe that'll work. So I'm waiting to see whether maybe it doesn't work that way. Maybe it's maybe that code doesn't work. Hey, what? Forget that. But we have this other this other piece of code over here. That's I guess why we need this code here. This code over here actually does establish the column names. So, for instance, now I can have a I can, if I wanted to, I can have a, b, and c. Uh, and let's go ahead and just let's, let's see what class. Uh, and there's some n in there. Try and remove this and see what I can kind of out using that. There we go. So I can create my table like this where I have column names A, B, and C as we've done before. But now what I'm going to do is I can actually say, okay, well, um, maybe I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe I maybe I, I'd like to. I don't want to use this code here. Maybe I don't want to use that code to create my table. Rather, I'd rather use just, I just I, the data comes to me like this, and then I need to add some some columns um, column names to the whole thing. So if the data comes to you like this, where you actually have to kind of add the, the column names after the data has been received, then you can use a piece of code like this, where you're actually saying, okay, well, the first column is going to be called column one, Oops. the second one is going to be called column two, and the third is going to be called column three. And so if you go ahead and run this, you'll see that your columns are all up there too. Now, if, for instance, you have the option of actually creating the data yourself, you can still create it in, in this case, where you're actually putting in like column one, column two, and column three here, and then the table should be exactly the same. But the reason why you'd, you'd use this is because 
when you download some data on data sets, they don't give you the names of the columns. There's no headers. And so you have no idea what these things are. And so it's really up to you to add your own headers. And so you might have the data in a variable, which is stored like this. And for instance, I could probably say this data as, how do this? Let's try this. My dad's, um, my numbers, um, data array. Um, oops. I'll just put it like this. That's going to be a string. Can I edit this code so that I can just go ahead and remove this and put instead of the actual numbers there, I'll put my data array. Hopefully I can. Uh, not for, oh, you know what? Um, they're not working out. Something's not connecting here. Well, anyway, it doesn't seem to work that way. Extraordinary, I don't know. I guess it, oh, here we are. Now that seems to work. Now if I go here, then, okay, so then I can do that. So if the data comes to you looking like this, where it's like a string, then you can put it into your, you can actually create a table using this by throwing the, 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 the array, or the, the variable that holds the array at this variable, or this, at this function here. And then you can define the column names right up here. And so the, um, the results are the same. So it's just a, something funny you can do. Let's go and put this back in there just so we have it. So anyway, that's, these are just different ways of, of creating tables that you might want to use if you're ever doing like a kind of what they call a back of the envelope type of calculation where you just have some, some data that you want to work with quickly and then kind of do something with that data. Um, so now getting back to our slides, what do we have here? So we um, there's other ways of actually loading files of data, and we've already run into one of these things before in, in our in our data that we were looking at just earlier. And that is that um, when we loaded our, our Trump file, we were actually able to load that file using a chooser. Now, for those of you who don't know what a chooser is, a chooser is a is a um, kind of an array that, or a panel that pops up. Um, which allows the user to actually go through the file system and to find that file. So for instance, I'm going to, I think we have some Sunspot data that we've been working with before in the, in the, uh, in the class, and I've put this data set into this, um, into your class docs repository. And so now you can just try this, uh, just go ahead and run this line here. And of course you can't see what I see, but I see a panel that, that, that pops up on my screen and that's asking me now, to, it's showing me my files. I can, I can click through and I can go to the, uh, the class docs repository, which is, where is that? Here, class docs, there we are. I can go to lessons, I can go to five and seven exploration, I go to my sandbox, and there we are, sunspots.csv. I go ahead and click on that, open, and you can see what happens now. My data set has just opened up here. And so this makes opening data very, very easy if you can just put together a chooser and say, yes, you know, the chooser just returns a file name. Just, it's just a string. It is a path and a file, and that is it. And then that information goes into this read table, which then loads that file. And over here, this, is in, this information here is this comma separation. This says that the data is going to be separated by a comma. Some data is separated by tabs, as we may have seen in some data sets. Um, other data sets may be separated by some other character. It doesn't really matter. But in this case, I have to tell it that each, each uh, data set or sorry, each entry or um, in the each cell is separated by a comma. So that's for each entry. Then this header equals true. That means that the table that I'm actually pulling over comes with its own header information. That means it says that it knows what the um, um, it knows what the you know, each each column has a has a name. If I didn't if I didn't have a column, if each column didn't have a name then I would say false, or I just leave this thing blank. What this thing does is it, it makes sure that the information, that, which is the header information, in other words, going back over here, uh, we see at the top month, day, uh, year, month, day, frac of year, all, all that information there could be misconstrued and look like data to our studio. And so we need to tell um, our studio that the first line is not data, but it's the, it's the column header. Now, if you don't do that and you're trying to make a plot, where let's say you're trying to plot the fraction of the year. These are all numbers and you should be able to plot these things very easily. But as soon as your plotter or your ggplot runs into a, the variable frac of year, 
uh, or the, you know, the, the value frac of year, it's going to get confused and it might throw an error, which is going to crash your, your plot. And so you need to go back to your, your data set and or your, your, when you're loading this thing here and say, no, 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 the first line of my table is not data, it's the header. That's how you get past the problem. Um, okay, so that's, that's all very cool. Let's go back to our slides, if I may. We're out of time here. Time flies in this. I have to tell you guys, the time absolutely flies. This is the fastest part of my week being here. It's because I, it's fun and exciting talking about analytics. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and just, I'll, I'll just I'll, I can I can run this now if I wanted to. This this code or this uh, this file that I've just loaded here. Actually, oh, sorry, this file I've just loaded is actually saved. All that information is saved into the Sunspot data one. Now this becomes the data that I'm using for this ggplot. Notice, by the way, that this ggplot function is always the same. It is never it never changes. Um, that is to say that if you just remember how to write your ggplot then it's going to be the same command day in, day out, and every time it's the same. You know, this, it's the same thing. In fact, if I run this with the data that I've just loaded from my Sunspot, give it some time, wait for it. Well, the fan on my machine is just flying right now. It's like just really whirring quickly uh, because uh, I have all this other stuff going, but that's why it's taking some time. Um, this is actually a rather remarkable plot I wanted to take you through this plot and show you something here. Maybe I can get this on, the, on, on my slides here, which is a, a little bit bigger. I think you can see um, you, know, you, can, you can see this plot. But I wanted to show you though um, that when you're looking at this data, notice how, for instance, we see okay, so we see the the trends, All right? Good. But I've changed the color here, so the color is now we have the x and the y, and those are the points. The x is the year, then a, a point was, and a, a point was reported. And the y is the number of points that we saw. So every point we see represents an observation of how many sunspots there were for a particular time. And then I add the color number of, of observations. That means that as, my, as the numbers of observations increases, the color becomes lighter. This is something we didn't see before. This is actually a very interesting observation, which um, although I don't know exactly why this is, I have some ideas. Um, but what is a very interesting observation that, 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 this, that merits some discussion, I think. What we see now is that it's saying here that as the sunspots, according to our little back of the envelope you know, analysis here, as the sunspots, or sorry, as we're getting closer and closer to the, the, you know, to the present day, there are more and more reported sunspots. Now, let me just ask you here, um, maybe this is a good place to start thinking about breaking, um, but let me just ask you, uh, what do you think would explain that? Are we having some kind of, is, is the sun having some kind of a, men, uh, a, a meltdown here where we're getting more and more sunspots as the day goes forward, as, the, as we get closer and closer to the present day? Someone was going to say something. I, what do you think? Uh, my assumption would be that just the advances in technology allows us to work. Yes. That is, <laughs> Raymond, you, you took the words out of my mouth. That's exactly what it was. That, that is, that's absolutely true. And so I wanted you to all be aware of this and that some of you will be going on into, and doing um, maybe projects in this class where you'll be looking at, um, thank you for that comment, Raymond, very helpful. But the, uh, some of you will be, will be looking at historical data, especially for instance, if you're in the area of like maybe, um, I don't know, economics and you're looking to see whether certain types of market shares or certain types of, of buying patterns have changed over the last 200 years. And so one of the big problems that you have to deal with is that you have more and more instruments nowadays, like as we get closer to the present day in your data set, there are more instruments and better ways of actually taking reading than there were maybe 200 years ago. And so back before 1850 in this graph, uh, you can see that there are fewer uh, sunspots, but that doesn't mean that there were actually fewer sunspots in reality. It just means that there were fewer sunspots noticed. And so take that into consideration when you're going through your analyses with historical data that, and, and, and in fact, we saw this um, with this data over here, um, here, um, historical data, there was like Harry asked Truman here, there was less data to actually use in some kind of analysis. And so it's up to you as the data scientist to think to yourself, what's the best way to compare, for instance, um, modern data, in this case, Trump's data, to Harry S. Truman's data, 
Or, for instance, in this in this uh, in this plot here, how do I make sense of the older data uh, in comparison to the new data? In other words, you're saying that after the year 2000, or maybe around the year 2000, the data began to become much more rich, many more observations. Does that suggest, for instance, that those observations weren't there in the beginning days, or or what? And so you have to address that. I would say, in, in when you're writing your 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 um, discussions, when you're working with your analyses, you have to address that the, the instrumentation that they used may not have been consistent. It may not, I mean, that this data represents a wide variety of, of, of different people taking observations. So it's really aggregated data that's all put together. And so you have to say, as you're writing a report, especially if you're writing a report here, that you explain the, the, the rising number of observations by the, 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 the better accuracy or the more sensitive um, uh, equipment that we have nowadays that wasn't present before. But again, ultimately though, that's just a theory. And so you have to, you have to think about, you know, does that theory actually work with this data? Maybe there were fewer sunspots. But by saying that, in, in saying that, for instance, the, the technology that we have now is, gives us better readings, you're actually saying though that even if there were fewer sunspots before, um, that we have no way of, of, of knowing, so therefore the data that suggests that is now being, is, has, has been invalidated. You're saying that even though I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm, we have better equipment now, um, we didn't have fewer observations. So that means you can just discredit this whole, that whole observation, even if it were true, for instance. Anyway, I'm kind of going around in circles here, but what I'm saying though is that you have to, you have to explain some of these observations and, and kind of introduce some kind of theory to explain how that observation is. It, it, it goes against, um, it goes against the, you know, the, the nature of this plot here, saying that there are fewer observations of sunspots out there. And so um, sometimes it's not easy to explain these things. I've seen arguments break out in, in conferences where people are getting all upset over things that really had, in my mind, nothing to do with it. Um, yeah, so anyway, this is, so what this is, I, I put this in here to remind you again, like when you find a really cool observation, a really cool plot, be sure to put that code into your, your script. To find this plot, you may have had to run like, several other plots before, and if those plots were no good, then there is no reason to save that code. But if, if the plot does have something interesting, if it is worth your time to go back and look at it again, then be sure to save that information. 